today concerning the future of Holocaust teaching uh, in the world, and I would like to invite her to give her address, please. Thank you very much. Uh, for proper disclosure, I did prepare one presentation, but following the very moving presentation of Justice Vita last night, I decided to change my uh, lecture. This year, uh, it is the 40th anniversary of the death of my grandfather, Michael Branner of blessed memory, and I had this dream of organizing a Kaddish prayer with a minion on his grave. The Kaddish prayer is one recited over a person who passed away, and according to the Jewish halacha, one has to, to recited when there's a million of people, namely 10 people. My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor who made it to the land of Israel after a lot of turbulation. He was a beloved grandfather, a, an honest man, and I dreamt of organizing a Kaddish with him, with a minion. After doing all I could to make sure that everyone would be here and think about different options of a minion, I learned that we were still lacking three people for the minion, and this is where the detection uh, mission started. It was very complex. As soon as we arrived in the uh, graveyard in Kiryat Shaul, I saw two couples, and I ran toward them, and I asked the men if they would agree to join our minion, and they answered yes. They said to me that they were going to their graves and that uh, I would call them when they were ready. I realized that we were lacking a tenth person, and I called Shaike, my husband, to bring something along the way. Shaike brought two soldiers he saw in the entrance to the cemetery, those young, uh, nice uh, men who joined us to recite the Psalms. Slightly before we arrived at the segment where you had to recite the Kaddish, I started running around the graves to look for a tenth person for the minion, and I didn't see those two couples. All of a sudden, I saw this the older man and a woman, and I ran toward them, and I was a bit moved, and I asked, asked that man, excuse me, was it you that I talked about, about joining our minion? And that person said no and remained silent and turned his back on me, and I continued to talk to him. Would you be willing to do me a favor and complete our minion? And he said, no, I'm not suitable, I'm not religious, I'm secular. And once again, he turned his back at me, and he remained silent. And I said, excuse me, are you Jewish? And he said, yes. I said, well, then you are suitable. And the man remained silent, and I saw in his face this expression of a lack of willingness to cooperate. And then I told him with great excitement, see what Hitler did to us. I do not have a family. They all died in the Holocaust. My father is the last survivor of our family, and I want to organize a Kaddish prayer for my grandfather who was a Holocaust survivor. Such a special man. Please come and help me. And the man remained silent, and with a very you know, expressed uh, lack of willingness started following me, and then I started telling me him that my father was a decent man, a very special man, an educated man, and was a great merchant, a businessman in Teplitzer, in the Sudet uh, area of, the, of Czechoslovakia. He left the camp in Trestnistia with nothing, and he came to Israel and was a milkman and loved this land so much, and this Jew continued to follow me in silence, and he was just, you know, dragging himself behind me like I was pulling him by the neck without any any, you know, wish or desire to join me. And when we arrived at the plot and he saw the two soldiers in their uniform, his eyes lit up and he joined the minion and very willingly answered, Amen. This tiny story unfolds the, my own personal biography, the professional research biography and the entire history of the people of Israel. It is impossible to understand and decipher it in any other context, only here in this very special place that is called the land of Israel and the state of Israel. But the thing that interests me most, that I would like to research more than anything, is why this man remained silent. His silence reverberated, but during this event that I described, his silence underwent a transformative process until it made it possible for that man to join the minion and say amen. This, uh, you know, utterance of the word amen from his uh, mouth went through a long process that it was accompanied by silence that needs to be researched and we need to talk about. This silence joins the greatest uh, silences of the Jewish history that is paved with uh, torture and pain that joins the silence of Aaron the priest when his two sons died that the Torah says and Aaron was silent. There are two central questions on the subject of the Holocaust that there's a lot of absolute silence 
silence about, about which we have never received an answer, and perhaps we never will. The first question is, how is it possible? How can it be that such a civilized nation, such as the German nation, could generate such a monstrous and primitive mechanism for the killing and the murder of innocent human beings? How is it possible that a group of so many civilized Germans who grew up on the uh, cradle of Western German glorious culture that enfolds values of beauty and aesthetics and human dignity could behave in such a brutal way while using monstrous and hideous means that even the imagination could not invent. And how could they do this to the Jews who were so very loyal to the German nation and worshipped the German culture and saw themselves as loyal German citizens? And the question must be asked, why was it so difficult for people in Germany to identify the real threat posed by Hitler to the world? And mostly, how was it that Germans living in that time did not wake up earlier? And the second question is, how is it possible that people who were so very intelligent, like the Jewish people, could go like sheep to slaughter to the, to the incarcerations and did not object? Those two basic questions are a source of shame shame and guilt. There are additional questions in the context of the last question that would uh, is strengthen further the aspect of shame and guilt, and that is, how is it possible that the Jewish settlement here in the land of Israel could not offer a helping hand? And the question raised by Elie Wiesel, how was it possible that they couldn't save at least the Jews of Hungary after everything was well known? And mostly the very troubling question which is, how was it possible that the world remained silent? Where was everyone? And why the, 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 the rescue forces loitered so much and why the international organization came so late. The topic of teaching the Holocaust in Israel and around the world has a clear relationship to these two basic questions, despite the fact that there's a great big silence about them. One of the biggest problems, in my view, is that to this day, the educational system and the theoretical literature dealt with this issue from the perspective of the victims, but to this very day, not a sufficient answer and not sufficient attention was given to a very profound discussion of the analysis of the pathology and the ramifications of it from the perspective of the Nazi, um, German Nazi murderer. The day will have enough courage to discuss directly those profound questions, how this could happen in Germany of all places without any you know, bleeding heart uh, Jewish attempts to uh, embellish it. On this day, we'll know that we extricated ourselves from this a bitter silence and we embark upon a new path. Perhaps this conference and the important discussions that would be held in it would help us in this lengthy process and would serve as a therapeutic educational corrective process indeed. When I started working on the teaching of the Holocaust in the world in the UNESCO pro uh, project, I realized that we are lacking an organizing conceptual framework that would help us conceptualize and understand better what this was about. Every educational topic exist on two main dimensions, on the dim dimension of time and place. In my current presentation, I will focus on the time dimension. When I did a meta-analysis for UNESCO of the uh, research uh, literature written here in Israel, starting from 1943 until this very day, I reached the conclusion that we can divide the teaching of the Holocaust and also the shaping of the Holocaust memory to four main periods. From 1943 to 1961, the period of silence or the, or, or the one in which we ignored the Holocaust and the memory of the Holocaust. From 1961 to 1980, the recognition. 1980 to 2000, the construction. And 2000 to this very day, the deconstruction. I will soon talk about the period of silence, but I would like to explain explain very briefly what happened afterwards. From 1961 to 1980, this was the recognition period. As of the Eichmann trial, 
when the Holocaust survivors uh, came to the uh, podium and exposed their uh, horror stories that made us uh, peep into a different planet that existed there in the concentration camps. In 1977, upon the rise of the Likud uh, party to power, the subject of the Holocaust uh, was transformed and became a central component in the Jewish identity and the civil religion of the State of Israel. As of 1980, you could see le legislation pertaining to the teaching of the Holocaust that became a mandatory uh, subject. This was the construction period, the structuralization of the topic on the national civil uh, level. As of 2000, we are witnessing a wave of criticism concerning the way the subject of the Holocaust was presented in Israel, and critical books are written about the uh, teaching of the Holocaust in Israel and its uses. I think these four uh, stages are not specific only to Israel, but rather are universal stages of contending with the subject of the Holocaust in many a country around the world, and they represent four different stages of universal contending with a national trauma. These days, I uh, established in the University of Lucerne an international research uh, group that would analyze this typology as it is expressed in different countries in the world. These four stages represent the transition from ontology to epistemology. Regretfully, I will not have enough time to explain these in my lecture because they uh, merit a different presentation in which I can explain every stage and how they represent uh, ontological and epistemological aspects. In this lecture, I would like, following um, what I said before, to focus on the period of silence which is less discussed, and it is one that there is a lot of polemics in the Israeli and the international research. Initially, there was a great science and not a bird trick, and nobody could talk. But there are researchers who argue that there was never a silence, and definitely there were very clear-cut statements and public deeds already at the establishment of of the State of Israel. The big deliberation concerning the reparation uh, uh, money and the Kastner trial and the Capo trials, everything was done uh, out loud and in public. In contrast to them, there were many researchers, among them uh, Eliezer Donichie and Bezvi, who dared talk about the silence and the way the subject of the Holocaust was ignored by the Israeli establishment and mostly by David Ben-Gurion, the first Prime Minister of the State of Israel. According to their studies, David Ben-Gurion, the first Prime Minister, on behalf of the stately approach actually ignored the subject of a Holocaust and removed it from the national agenda intentionally. The basic perception that motivated him was that we have to build here in the land of Israel a new Jew that is uh, profoundly different from the Jew of the Holocaust. Uh, the new Jew is an active man that fights for its existence and the political and state independence unlike the uh, Jew of the exile that lacked uh, political uh, rights and had to actually uh, sort of uh and allow himself in order to live and uh, exist uh, in those countries. As a part of the uh, national liberation process, they had to actually cancel uh, and rule out the ideology of the Holocaust. Everything that was done away from Israel that was related to the exile was something that was actually to be uh, uh, done away with. This worldview of uh, Ben-Gurion made him despise uh, uh, the Holocaust survivors that he called a dust of human beings. Those researchers, mostly Donichte and Stauber, bring uh, evidence according to which Ben-Gurion never participated in the official ceremonies to marking the Holocaust uh, memories and only, and only in certain cases sent a very short letter and that actually shaped their attitude toward the Holocaust survivors. This attitude of Ben-Gurion to the Holocaust only changed in 1961 after Adolf Eichmann was apprehended by the state of Israel and was brought to trial in Jerusalem. The act of apprehension and bringing to trial uh, by the State of Israel was seen to, in his eyes as the embodiment of the land of Israeli uh, independence. He was perceived as Jewish heroism of pride Jews, unlike the conduct of the Jews in exile. Ben-Gurion could not understand the helplessness of the Jews in the Holocaust and their passivity vis-a-vis -vis the cruel Nazi 
the enemy. There are those who argue that that's the reason why he never made an effort to rescue the Jews and do anything political and military for their rescue. Some argue that he never tried to rescue Jews because he knew that he didn't have the power to tangibly help them. Despite that, he never thought that he needed to uh, behave uh, with some uh, modesty vis-a-vis -vis the Holocaust uh, survivors with respect to the criticism that he leveled at them. Some argued that the revolution of the new Jew was basically a Jewish secularization uh, revolution and that the new Jew was a secular Jew unlike the religious one in exile. Hence, there was those who argued that Ben-Gurion despised the Holocaust survivors because they were identified with their religious communities and the uh, religious Jewish uh, culture that uh, was destroyed that he wanted to disconnect himself from. This at, uh, attitude was uh, entailed a substantive um, change in the national pyramid and the order of priorities of the Jews uh, living in the uh, diaspora. And instead of that, you had to uh, place the Jewish uh, muscled pioneer, the farmer that actually blooms the desert. It is well known that in the idea of Ben-Gurion, he wanted to write a farmer uh, as profession because that was his wish. Uh, the researchers dealing with uh, silence analyze it from two perspectives. Silence that stem from the trauma that the survivors uh, went through and also the lack of ability to talk because nobody would understand and nobody would believe. Those who are familiar with the professional literature dealing with trauma know that the victims in the first stage, because of their shock, cannot talk. They cannot believe and they suppress. This is a well-known response, but it is only one aspect of the problem. There are those who are, are interested in, in not in remaining silent because that brings them back to the point of departure and that serves as a defense mechanism because they wish to move ahead. They don't want to go back to the past. But those who were traumatized and managed to talk complain about the fact that they feel that they have no one to talk to because who listen to them either do not believe them or cannot understand what the victim has experienced. Hence, they choose to remain silent. Many, indeed, are ashamed of what happened and they therefore remain silent. They were ashamed because of what happened to them, because they did not act, and also because of the substantial hurt and what they had to do when they came to Israel to work in various simple jobs like uh, street cleaners uh, and uh, gardeners and milkmen. And that transition from dignified profession that is in line with their education to what they do now broke them down. And also, you know, some experienced unemployment with some shame it was accompanied by guilt because they were served because they survived and others died. And there were also Capo and Judenrat who cooperate with the Nazis and were ashamed about what they did. Only in recent years, books were published about this, but that merits a different discussion. Some argue about this typology that maybe I had to forego the first uh, stage of the silence and leap directly into the Eichmann trial. And indeed, there are historians that start the historiography of the shaping of the Holocaust memory from the Eichmann trial, or even even later, from the 1970s, when the television broadcast the series Holocaust, Shoah, and reached directly every home in Israel. So the question of time and the organization of the time frame is a very significant and critical uh, question. I think the stage of period, the period of silence, is very, very sh uh, formative because it allows for an incubation that allows for introspection and retrospection. Hence, it is a formative stage that shapes every uh, next uh, period in line. People need to mature in order to talk. The quality of the way they deal with silence allows us to understand better and healthier with all the other stages. We should also mention that the period of silence is not a passive one, but rather an active one. Every silence is active and a lot of effort in it is invested in it. You can see the investment of effort in this stage of silence and in the national silencing. Silence has a violent potential as well. Silence Silence very often is related to shame, as I said before. Silence is a re relational state, and it's always done in relationship to some sort of a social observer. The social component is the one that actually in, in strengthens shame, but also strengthens the potential of the promise that a man would never repeat his shameful deeds. It is the source of agency and uh, receiving responsibility. Shame deals with the way uh, others view us. Hence, it is an emotion that depends on the tangible or the imagined presence of others. Hence, it is possible that the individual can 
The individual can be with himself or herself, but think about how others view them in a certain state and feel shame. Actually, the feeling of the Holocaust survivor is strengthens, strengthened, resulting from the social atmosphere shaped by David Ben-Gurion, which strengthened the helplessness in the short term and the long term, as we'll see. It is that sh sense of shame and extricating from it at the later stage that allowed for resilience and a healthy shaping of the memory of the Holocaust among the Holocaust survivors and through the Holocaust survivors. This social relational aspect is the source of the problem but also the source of solution because shame, being ashamed of others prevents people from violating social norms but also allows the individual to have a high motivation to improve his deeds. Hence, we can see the substantial educational role that silence and shame have. In the literature, we see a distinction between guilt and shame. Guilt is a negative feeling that the man has to contend uh, alone, but with shame, one contends with this in relationship to others, and shame brings them to soul searching and deeds. Uh, shame has a number of stages, the emotional and the conscious uh, stage in which reflection is done on shame. Shame is a stage of recognition that allows for an illusion of control and acceptance in the future. I did something bad, next time I will not do this, and I will avoid other pe I prevent other people from hurting me. In other words, the stage of faith, shame allows for agency, as I said, an initiative for the creation of a better future vis-a-vis -vis the world of chaos that I live in. Uh, educationally, the stage of shame is a very important educational stage that gives resilience. The problem in our generation is not the shame. The problem in our generation is the loss of shame. When a person is ashamed, he actually musters all the uh, power he has to prevent this from recurring in the future. Shame brings about sense of guilt, and the loss of shame causes uh, us to become obtuse and indifferent. And indifference, as Elie Wiesel told me personally, indifference kills. To conclude, I would like to conclude with a personal note. For many, many years, I've been facilitating uh, dialogue groups here in Bar Ilan University between Arab and Jewish students in a course for education for democracy and peace. My professional life was devoted to education for peace, and in, in this coming Shabbat, I'm supposed to get a prize uh, in Chicago about this. One of the, thank you very much. I'm not traveling. I will be receiving this in my absence. One of the topics that truly trouble me is the fact that very, very often in my meetings with Germans, I'm hearing them say, as in the meeting that was held in Barilan, uh, when uh, in the UNESCO chair three weeks ago, students from Germany, Arabs and Jews, uh, convened, uh, priest uh, Sorgel from Plusfenburg said, in the past you Jews had a conflict with us, the Germans, and now you Jews have a conflict with the Palestinians in which we mediate. This comparison between the conflict, the Israeli-Arab conflict, and the Holocaust is flawed factually and morally and has to trouble us. The Holocaust de facto cannot be compared to no genocide and no conflict between tribes as we could see in Rwanda and definitely not any territorial conflict between nations like the Israeli-Arab conflict. The Holocaust is distinct and different from any form of genocide because the goal of the Holocaust was the final solution which meant a systemic elimination and extermination of the Jewish people as a part of an ideological conception of the need for an ethnical and racial cleansing and leaving in the world only the pure, superior, airy race. This monstrous approach that was planned meticulously in the Vance conference found an attentive ear and gained the cooperation of many a citizen in Germany that never protested against it and turned into its soldiers and those who carried out its orders and by that became an 
active integral part of the murder mechanism of innocent Jews, blurring these basic facts during the dialogue and bypassing the theoretical, practical discussion of the complexity of it and the practical ramifications of it would never allow us to truly contend with what happened and what needs to be learned educationally in the Holocaust. Regretfully, according to testimonies that we find in the professional literature, see Reinhold Bushke's article in my project in UNESCO. In many parts of Germany, there are many young people who still admire Hitler and his philosophy, and according to the opinion of the researchers, are addicted to the neo-Nazi theory, and the educational system finds itself helpless. Uh, this issue is a testimony to the loss of shame and the fact that it, you know, it disappeared from the arena too quickly. The very troublesome data about the rise of anti-Semitism in Germany and the way Mein Kampf became a bestseller in Germany and across the world should be of great concern to us. How can we explain the way thousands of citizens in Germany and around the world rushed to buy a copy of this hideous book and educators and no one else should remain silent. We should never remain silent. We have to bring these issues up and discuss them above the table without any shame in our hearts. This is the reason why in education we must emphasize what we must learn from the Holocaust more than discussing the Holocaust itself. It's not about the Holocaust, but from the Holocaust. Uh, shame in this context is an educational, methodical, tool of the highest order to contend with problematic phenomena of this nature. This is the moment in education in Germany to focus on the murderer, beside the empathy that one has for the victims. One has to analyze, despite the shame, uh, the motivations of the German murderer. What were the institutionalized mechanisms that allowed it to make such great to, re to achieve such monstrous dimensions and what were the reasons for the success of the Social Democratic Party? How, how is it possible that even in our days there is still a significant group of young people who believe and yearn for the return of this movement to power? Shame is the sieve, the most important sieve through which one uh, ha has to uh, put the therapeutic process. Before this shame, there will never be a remedy for this terrible disease. Today, in the educational field in general, and and in the UNESCO chair that I had in particular, there are many pedag pedagogical methods and practical methodologies with which we can actually contend with historic issues and social issues that are extremely complex and embarrassing. And this is the minute to bring them to the center stage and to the center of dialogue. It is only with great courage uh, and a courageous contending with a loss of shame and leaving the silence, the embarrassing silence that prevails, it is only in such a way that we can promise a better future to our children here on planet Earth. And let us pray together that he who makes peace in the heavens will bring peace to us and to the entire people of Israel and the world at large. And may we all say...